You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with politics editor at Galden, Moya Lothian, and Mo Lothian McLean, forgotten your double barrel name there, and uh, Whitehall editor for the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Daily Telegraph reports that police officers who stand on duty in Downing Street have been interviewed by Sue Gray for her Partygate investigation. The Guardian leans on the Prime Minister facing calls to open an investigation after a Conservative MP accused members of her party of saying her being Muslim made others uncomfortable. The Daily Express also has that story with an exclusive from Transport Secretary Grant Schatz saying the Prime Minister realises there needs to be a change in Downing Street. The Metro leads on Russia and Ukraine tensions, quoting the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK, saying they will fight to the death if Russia invades. The Daily Mail quotes a top minister claiming that the whole cabinet would back a delay to the national insurance hike to help families hit by the cost of living crisis. The Daily Mirror has examples of those most affected by the cost of living crisis. The Times, the Financial Times, reports that Unilever is facing pressure from an activist hedge fund which is building a stake in the company. And The Sun reports that Katie Price could be facing up to five years in prison for allegedly breaching a restraining order. Joined tonight by Moya Lothian McLean and Sebastian Payne. Good to see you both. Thank you. Uh, you can take us through the papers this evening, all the way through uh, till uh, midnight. Let's um, have a look at the Guardian front page, and uh, they're suggesting that the, the Prime Minister has been pulled into this. Tory row, they're describing it as, over a party Islamophobia. Uh, Nusrat uh, Ghani, the claims that, that she's made. The Prime Minister did actually meet with uh, the Minister as she was then, but is he still at fault, Sebastian? Well, I think what Nusrat Ghani said, we had a bit of backwards and forth today on this story, that she gave an interview in the Sunday Times where she said that after she was sacked as Transport Minister in February 2020, uh, she had a meeting with a whip who has now been identified as the chief whip, Mark Spencer, who, and she alleged that he said to her that her um, Muslim background was making colleagues feel uncomfortable. Obviously, she was very distressed by this allegation and later had a meeting with Boris Johnson and Downing Street confirmed that Nusrat Ghani had met with Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson wrote to her 10 days later and said that there should be a party investigation, a Tory party inquiry into these comments or not. Ms Ghani then released a statement this afternoon saying that, in fact, this is not a party matter. This is a government matter. This is not for Conservative HQ to decide this. Uh, and she actually expressed her disappointment that the government, led by Prime Minister Boris Johnson, had not taken this matter very seriously. Now, we should say Mr Mark Spencer, who is the, the chief whip, has denied this as categorical not true, and said it's defamatory and false. But it feels to me that there's going to have to be some kind of investigation, because the comments that Ms Garney have made are very precise, and it's hard why you would make something up like that. Um, and on the other hand, you've got Mark Spencer saying the complete opposite. So someone is really getting wrong at the stick or not telling the truth here. And of course, the whole accusation has come at a time when the whole government's under a mount of strain. This is an epic week ahead for Boris Johnson and his whole government. And a racism row, I'm sure, is the last thing the Prime Minister wanted. So I imagine in the next 24 hours, we want to act quite swiftly to try and deal with this. Uh, uh, Moya, do you think that swift action may come in the form of an investigation? I mean, it seems like the Tory party are drowning in inquiries and investigations at the moment, doesn't it? Uh, I believe at this point that it doesn't seem like there's any other alternative. Uh, it would be coming straight off the back of the Singh inquiry, which we had the results of just last year, which did find that there was significant anti-Muslim sentiment within the Tory party at large. Uh, but there will have to be a sort of independent inquiry focusing solely on government process, I think, uh, just based off what um, Ms Ghani has raised. Yes, the Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, has um urged uh, Ms Ghani to, to make a formal complaint to the party. But as we're saying, she's not necessarily sure that that is the, the, the best route. But we've had other um, cabinet ministers come out and uh, give their tuppence worth, haven't we, Sebastian? 
Yes, that we saw Sajid Javid, the health secretary, has come out to uh, defend Ms. Ghani and say that this should be thoroughly investigated. And Nadim Zahawi, the education secretary. And what's so striking about Mr. Javid's comment is that he came up after the Downing Street statement here. And that's why I think it's inevitable there's going to have to be some kind of investigation into this, because at the moment, uh, Ms. Ghani has made those, made, made those allegations and Mr. Spencer has denied them. I don't think the Tory party would want to dispute this in a court of law. That would not go down well at all. So um, it is a very damaging one for the government. And of course, um, ethnic minority voters, and particularly Muslim voters, will see this and it may add to preconceptions they have about what they feel about the Conservative Party. So the last general election, 64% of the of the BAME community voted for Labour versus 19% for Conservatives. And the Conservatives have long struggled to gain votes within the Muslim communities. So, and when they see comments like that, you, you know, it speaks to, I think, this perception the party hasn't dealt so well with Islamophobia. And uh, Moy just mentioned the Singh Inquiry, which came following a whole host of reports of activists um, and comments by um, more senior people in the party that were judged to be Islamophobic. Uh, the Singh Inquiry concluded there was not institutional um, Islamophobia within the party, but highlighted big problems in the way it was being dealt with in terms of the complaint procedure. And I think that's, again, exactly what you're seeing with Nusrat Khan here that uh, you pass this off to the party when it's a serving government minister, a chief whip, who's allegedly said this, it needs to be taken far more seriously. Uh, let's go back to the investigation that we know is underway, and we're hoping to hear uh, from that this week, that Sue Gray's investigation. Um, they have spoken to police officers uh, at Downing Street, the Daily Telegraph, tell us more. Yeah, so Sue Gray is apparently speaking to all and sundry who may have any information about this party and is not just relying on the hearsay of uh, people, civil servants and staff at Downing Street, but is checking things like security passes, apparently the Prime Minister's diary. And according to this report from The Telegraph, uh, officers have been all too willing to speak and that the material that's been disclosed has apparently been significant. Uh, a source said, put it this way, if Boris Johnson is still Prime Minister by the end of the week, I'd be very surprised. I think the main question we have from this is, if Met officers do have substantial information that will change the outcome of this inquiry and perhaps make Boris Johnson's position untenable, as reported by The Telegraph. And are they, if they are only too willing to speak to Gray, what is that information going to say? And if it incriminates Downing Street staff, why was it not acted upon earlier by officers? Well, well that's the thing, Sebastian, isn't it? Because it would implicate the officers if, if they didn't come forth with the information prior to being asked about it. Well, indeed. And obviously, the, the point that thing's been made is that um, those who broke COVID regulations um, for the first time were given one-off on-the-spot fines of £100 that then doubled on every subsequent um, 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 incident. Now, obviously, there could be a question about why the police did not do that. I think the Met would probably say that, in fact, the police were there, you know, to do diplomatic protection. They were not there as normal constables enforcing the laws. But it is a very good question that if this was happening, and on the kind of industrial scale... We've seen reported with a party with over 100 people. Why was that not reported to their superiors and why was something not done about it? And of course, you have to ask a question that in some of the parties that we've seen reports of, there was pizza delivered. Did the police take that pizza from the gate? Or did they deliver it to the party itself? So, yes, I'm sure it wouldn't at all surprise me following the Gray inquiry if there was further inquiries into the police's role in this whole incident. But uh, the Telegraph splash really is quite bombastic stuff there. That, you know, that quote that Moyo just read out, saying, I'd be surprised if Boris Johnson was PM by the end of the week. You know, the sp space that I see this inquiry being is there were about 50-50 at the moment from Boris, John Boris Johnson getting challenged in the next couple of days, that those less of no confidence have to reach 54 to have that vote. I think they're currently about 30, but no one really knows for certain. And I think depending on what comes out in the Gray inquiry, it could be significantly higher. And really, for the Prime Minister, it's going to come down to that crucial party in May 2020, which he personally attended. And has he been forthright and strong? 
straightforward about what he knew about that. And if Miss Gray, who is a very experienced civil servant, has got a very delicate balancing act to get, get through, if she concludes that he has not been forthright and has not been honest with Parliament, then I think it might not even reach a confidence vote. It may be that the Cabinet say to him, look, if you've lied to Parliament, that's normally a resigning matter under the ministerial code. So the next couple of days in Westminster politics are going to be quite something. Uh, very quickly, before we move on to Ukraine, did you say that you'd be surprised if Boris Johnson was there by the end of the week? Well, that was the quote in the Telegraph. I'm not saying that, no. sorry. Oh, yeah. The Telegraph <laughs> was there. Quoting a police okay, source I thought, there. No, I, I, I thought I, you were I, adding. I thought I you were adding your opinion. This whole thing is so volatile, includes so many different factors. Uh, it would not be a good idea to make any judgments yeah. or predictions about where exactly it's going to go. Very difficult to call. Uh, let's move on to Ukraine in the Financial Times. And uh, Moya, really, the, the question now is: I mean, is this at the brink of, of war, or can diplomacy pull it right back? Well, to be honest with you, I, I've got no idea. It certainly seems uh, as if we are on a precipice and about to fall off, given that the UK came out yesterday, uh, made a very strong statement about Putin uh, attempting to install what they called a puppet government uh, in Ukraine. Now we've got the US, we've got Antony Blinken calling uh, Russia's recent actions to destabilise Ukraine, something straight out of the Russian playbook, which is certainly... Uh, drastic talk. Uh, the US has also said via Blinken that um, there will be severe consequences if Russia does invade Ukraine for a second time. But so far, these consequences thus discussed between European and other Western states, such as the US, uh, seem to be in the form of sanctions, which hasn't deterred Russia at all. Uh, Russia simply does not want Ukraine to join NATO and they will invade uh, and do anything to stop it, basically. Uh, we've run out of time, but uh, hope to pick up on Ukraine when we come back from the break for the moment. Thank you. Coming back, uh, we'll be talking about uh, this story in the Daily Telegraph. The biggest ever recruitment drive for magistrates is being launched, with everyone from bricklayers to teachers being urged to apply in an effort to increase diversity. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Still with me, the politics editor at Galdem, Moya Lothian McLean, and Whitehall editor for the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. Um, let's just pick up with Ukraine again, Sebastian. Um, and this headline in the Metro, which is um, incredibly worrying a fight to the death. This is the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK, uh, an interview that he'd given to Trevor Phillips on Sunday. Uh, and he was absolutely adamant about what he was saying. It was a very powerful interview, actually, and I think it speaks to uh, the drasticness of the situation at the moment, that obviously the UK alleged over the weekend that, um, that, that Russia was looking to install a puppet regime into Ukraine. And this was quite rare for Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, to come up with such a big allegation. And it's been backed up, I think, on the front of the FT as well by Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, who said they've been concerned about this for quite a long time. But it is very clear that if Vladimir Putin does invade, and all the evidence suggests that uh, he is, or at least he's very serious about the threat, then Ukraine will fight back. And I think that's exactly as the front page as the Metro strikes there. And I think it's all incredibly worrying for everyone involved. And obviously, those talks are still continuing. And the US and Russia have been in dialogue for quite some time now to, to try and avoid uh, an actual armed conflict. But at the moment, that's not going anywhere. And I think everyone's watching to see what happens after the Beijing Olympics, which is seen as potentially the most potent time. But the situation there is just very, very difficult. And you've just got to think about all the people in Ukraine and it's very good to see the UK is on the front line for this and is very much putting as many resources in as possible to help uh, the poor Ukrainian people who find themselves facing a huge army with, a, with an aggressor um, who's got no purpose for what he wants to try and do there. Yeah, very difficult situation. And uh, the Metro saying that Putin has warned of appropriate retaliatory military technical measures unless a list of demands are met, including a promise NATO will never admit Ukraine as a member. And we know from that interview that the uh, ambassador was saying that that's something that they would want to, to consider. So whether that can be a condition um, that NATO will agree to is highly unlikely. Uh, let's have a look at the mirror. Uh, and this story on the energy crisis, and it's actually, um, you know, a, a human story, just talking about the, the victims of the, the energy crisis. Moya. 
Yeah, so this is the Mirrors talked to two pensioners, uh, Diane Skidmore and Jack Mortimer, who are currently struggling with the rising cost of energy. Uh, for example, Diane's story, she's 71 years old, she lives in South London, she currently lives on £600 a month. Her energy bills have gone up by 50%. She says she's always shivering, she says people who come to the flat are always cold. Um, and this is really a story about the wider energy crisis that's going on. Uh, bills have already gone up by a significant amount, um, and there's a price cap changing in April, which means an estimate think that it will already it will increase more by over 51 percent this is part of a wider uh rise in cost of living that they're calling the big squeeze um and basically it's it's a crisis in the making it's uh stagnating wages plus the covid squeeze plus a national insurance hike plus these energy um, energy bill rises and the removal of the boost in universal credit just when it was most needed and it is creating um a real of hundreds and thousands of people who are in real trouble right now. There's a huge pressure on the government to do something ASAP to prevent hundreds and thousands sliding further into poverty. But as of yet, nothing has been announced. And the Mirror in this particular article are causing calling for uh, VAT to be removed from these energy bills to save costs. Yeah, the Mirror does do a good job at uh, really bringing the human story to, to the fore, doesn't it, Sebastian? It does, and I think the uh, the energy crisis and the, the general cost of living crisis, inflation bite, is going to be one of the big political stories, um, I think, of the coming months. And were it not for the situation in Ukraine and the d unstable political situation in Westminster, that would be the top of headlines. And when you see stories like the front page of the Mirror and many other papers, there is a very clear human cost there to what this is already starting to bite in terms of food prices, in terms of energy prices. And I forgot to mention with Ukraine as well before that uh, if the West um, brings in economic sanctions, which we've already talked about doing, um, if, if, if Russia invades Ukraine, then they may retaliate by um, stifling gas supplies. And that, again, could make the situation even worse. And I think to the front page of the Times tomorrow, it says Minister been prepared for eye-watering rises in gas prices if Ukraine is invaded. And this spirals into economic sanctions on top of each other. So I think, fundamentally, the government is probably going to have to do something, whether it's VAT, being knocked off energy bills, which, if we recall, during the 2016 referendum, one Boris Johnson advocated as something we could do if we voted for Brexit. Yet, curiously, his government hasn't done that. The other thing, which is on the front page of the Mail, is the idea that um, the NI rise is coming in April um, to pay for social care and the, bat and the COVID backlog on the NHS could be delayed. And the Mail are saying there's a majority cabinet support for that. So I think in the coming weeks, the government will do something from this menu of options. But in the meantime, yes. I think it's clearly being felt out there.